Universities are supposed to be in the business of illumination. But as we've seen in recent cases at Caltech and UC Berkeley, that, that's not always the case. Brave women recently alerted my office to still more harassment in astronomy. Now, at the University of Arizona. I ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record this report from the University of Arizona regarding a Dr. Timothy Slater. This report was sealed for over a decade while Dr. Slater went on with his career. His example shows why so few women continue careers in science and engineering. Some universities protect predatory professors with slaps on the wrist and secrecy just like the Catholic Church sheltered child molesting priests for many decades. Yeah, you heard that right. A representative from California, Jackie Speer, stood on the floor of the U.S. Congress and told the world that sexual harassment in the field of astronomy is on par with the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal. I mean, wow. Even Pope Francis would agree those are some very strong words. After all, she's drawing a comparison between something that allegedly happened to adults in a handful of universities, maybe two or three by her account, Caltech, Berkeley, and the University of Arizona, and one of the worst tragedies and cover-ups in recent human history, something that affected tens of thousands of children across the globe. So the sexual harassment that Congresswoman Speer is talking about must be pretty dire, right? Well, I guess that all depends on your definition of dire. I'm going to read some witness statements from the 2004 University of Arizona investigation that Congresswoman Speer mentioned. As I read these, I want you to keep it in mind that these are adults giving testimony about other adults. As always, I'll provide the links to this and any other sources I use in this video down in the video description so you can check it all out yourselves. Witness A recalled that Dr. Slater frequently told sexual jokes, made invitations to bathe in his hot tub at house parties, and joked that bathing suits were optional. Witness A recalled that Dr. Slater and his wife gave sex toys to guests and chocolate handcuffs to a graduate student. On one occasion, the witness recalled that Dr. Slater mentioned that so-and-so was sleeping with so-and-so and isn't it great? He went on to say, now everyone on the CAPER team, CAPER is the astronomy team he ran at the University of Arizona, has had sex at my house. I can't wait to install the cameras, or words to that effect. Witness A did not respond, but felt the question, so why not you, was implied by Dr. Slater. Dr. Slater inquired about Witness A's sex life on more than one occasion, and asked whom Witness A would be having in when Witness A requested a private room during departmental travel. Immediately upon her hire, Witness B noticed that Dr. Slater conducted himself in a sexualized manner that she found to be inappropriate and outside her comfort level. Witness B stated she is definitely not the only one toward whom Dr. Slater is sexual in his conduct. General behaviors include stopping in his tracks whenever he sees a woman walk by in a short skirt, even insisting that all conversation cease so he can take in the scene. Witness B stated, Dr. Slater relates most things to sex. For example, on one occasion when Witness B brought in a large blue exercise ball for seating, he told her he had a prohibition against having blue balls in, <laughs> having blue balls in the office. On another occasion, he told Witness B that he had considered inviting her to swim over the weekend, but knew she would bring her bathing suit, so he decided against it. Witness B stated that Dr. Slater and Witness J make a lot of sexual jokes and create sexual banner on a regular basis. She noted a lot of the women tend to ignore this when it is occurring around them. On a regular basis, Dr. Slater has told Witness B she would teach better if she did not wear underwear. On at least one occasion, he grabbed her underwear through her dress, stretched it and snapped it and said, you'd look a whole lot better without these on, or words to that effect. That same day, he invited her to attend a lunch with a visiting female graduate student from Boston and Witness J. Dr. Slater indicated they would be lunching at a local topless bar. At lunch, both Dr. Slater and Witness J paid for and received lap dances. Dr. Slater offered to purchase a lap dance for Witness B. She declined, and he did not push the issue further. Witness B reported that during the semester, the sexual conduct occurs daily. You can check out more of those statements on your own if you want. 
But I think that was a large enough sample to find something truly egregious if it was there to find. Except for the underwear snapping and where Dr. Slater should keep his hands to himself, they're all pretty much offhand or racy comments or jokes that you really have to try to be offended by. But okay, maybe I'm just some shitlord ogre who doesn't understand what true sexual harassment is. Fine. I'll go ahead and grant that Dr. Slater and his caper colleagues stepped over the line more than a decade ago. But to compare them to predator priests, there must be some evidence of repeated behavior since then, right? I mean, that's what predator priests did. They dodged any true punishment, got shipped elsewhere, and started diddling kids all over again, right? In Dr. Slater's case, however, there's nothing of the kind going on. Here's an excerpt from his mea culpa regarding the investigation. More than 10 years later, the rumor mill now enthusiastically whispers that I am a serial sexual harasser. All ongoing gossip to the contrary, no further evidence of sexual harassment has ever been presented to a mandated investigative authority since that time. On the contrary, through multiple reviews, both the University of Arizona and the University of Wyoming formally determined that our conduct is sufficiently safe to grant both Dr. Prather, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and me tenured positions that require us to interact intensively with both undergraduate and graduate students. Although it has been suggested that sexual harassment training doesn't work, it definitely worked for me. I now continuously educate my graduate students, male and female, about sexual harassment and how to be sure it doesn't happen, how to avoid being a victim, and how to report it when it is observed. We learned our lessons for how to make a more productive research team. But maybe there are more examples Congresswoman Speer didn't mention from other schools and their faculty, which would suggest that this sexual harassment problem in astronomy or the STEM fields as a whole is in fact rampant, right? Here's an example the New York Times felt was important enough to put in its prestigious publication. Jesse Shanahan, a 24-year-old graduate student at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, posted a series of tweets on Wednesday about her experience of being harassed by a fellow student. He would send unwanted text and Facebook messages at all hours and threaten self-harm if she refused his attention, she wrote. He made fun of me if I got a question wrong in class, gave me incorrect help on homework so I'd fail, constantly insulted me, hashtag Astro SH. He told me crude details of his sex life I didn't want to hear. If I said I was busy, he stayed anyway. Hashtag Astro SH. Okay, that hashtag is shorthand for astronomy sexual harassment. If after hearing that last example, the desperation in this mindless attempt to make a mountain out of an empty molehill hasn't become clear to you, go ahead and visit Twitter and peruse that Astro SH hashtag you will find the same people who pretended shirt storm and Tim Hunt's silly jokes about segregated labs heralded the misogynistic end of civilization. Yep, feminists and social justice warriors and atheism plus people whose greatest talents seem to be turning someone saying good morning to them into attempted sexual assault. There's Astro Katie, the bad astronomer Phil Plate, Dr. Pamela Gay, and Skeptics, and on and on and on. These people, as you can see from the incestuous retweeting that goes on between them, are all really good buds, and encourage one another to wallow in their permanent victim status and the Patreon funds that follow. And their off-the-charts fainting couch hysteria is matched only by their shameless hypocrisy, because, of course, their sexually charged dialogue and humor is just peachy and fine, and exempted from the zero-tolerance policy they try to drop on the heads of everyone else, you and me, the little people. Imagine the meltdown these people would experience if they found evidence of Dr. Slater or his caper team members partaking in similar ribald merriment. Are you saying men smell worse than women? Yes. I'm saying men's okay. locker rooms smell worse. <laughs> <laughs> So how, the, do, the, how do you know that? No, I'm just saying. <laughs> We're not going there. One thing you can count on from these authoritative, regressive liberal types is the demand that you do as they say, not as they do. 
I mean, let's be real here for a minute. What adult has not cracked a bunch of raunchy jokes in his or her lifetime, quite a few of which inevitably are going to be in the presence of coworkers and colleagues? And which joke went too far? Or how many is too many? Who gets to determine all of this? Who's going to get appointed to the Committee on Intolerable Offenses and why? And who the fuck wants to live in a world where we are so closely and strictly monitored? And where offending adults is treated like you went on a child molesting spree? It is sheer madness. But all right, maybe it's me again. Maybe like previously when I wasn't recognizing sexual harassment that was actually there. Maybe this madness was just a one-off. And Congresswoman Spear simply and accidentally stated her case a little too strongly on just one occasion. Maybe I'm the one making a mountain out of a molehill. Here's an excerpt from her letter to the Department of Education's Civil Rights Office, where she repeats the same exact despicable comparison. The Slater case, while lurid, is just a symptom of a much larger problem. How to prevent harassment and effectively deal with it when it occurs. Dr. Slater states that he is now reformed, but there are still few consequences for faculty members who sexually harass students. In some ways, the situation is reminiscent of the Catholic Church's coddling of child molesting priests. As in the church, universities protect perpetuators with slap on the wrist punishment and secrecy, while victims are left alone to try to put their academic careers and lives back together. Yep, the situation is reminiscent of child molesting priests, except for the fact that it happened to adults, not children. There was no actual sex, let alone rape or molestation, performed by students or University of Arizona faculty members, and no evidence of repeat, quote, offenses, unquote. Except for all those important distinctions and differences, the two incidents are reminiscent, because, I guess, they both happened on the same planet. Like playing tennis and building igloos are reminiscent. Take a look around you at all the modern conveniences you enjoy. They wouldn't be there without the hard work and dedication of scientists that are now under full assault for meaningless bullshit. I might sympathize with feminists if these scientists were guilty of stuff that matters. But sorry, wearing bowler shirts, making lab segregation jokes, and wisecracks about blue exercise balls used for chairs just ain't cutting it. I'm not giving up modern conveniences for all of that nonsense. There is barely anything in these examples of so-called sexism in STEM fields that rises to the level of interest, let alone true sexual harassment. There's no statement anywhere from Dr. Slater or his CAPER team members that included an or else threat. And despite what academia, corporate America, and lawyers insist, that is what the rest of us sane people understand sexual harassment to be. Do this sexual favor for me or else. Dr. Slater never threatened anyone in that manner and really only cracked a bunch of bad jokes. Well, okay, maybe one or two of them got to me, fine. Yet he is still being put through the ringer over and over again. And even if you think I'm wrong about the definition of sexual harassment, there is without a doubt nothing that warrants the comparison to child molesting priests. The two separate situations should never be uttered in the same breath by anyone who expects to be taken seriously anywhere and whose job it is to go to Washington and represent the people of her state. I strongly encourage California voters to choose someone with the mental and moral capacity to tell the difference between the two situations. Jackie Spear has proven she does not deserve to hold the position she somehow managed to get elected to.